welcome your participation in the video history senior instrument song survey. Could you please begin by introducing yourself? Good morning. I'm Wendy Barton. I'm, um, we came to Slave Lake um, 45 years ago in 1965. I was born in Barhead, uh, November of 1940. Dennis? <laughs> Good morning. Dennis Barton, born in Edmonton, lived in Barhead, small community outside of Barhead for a while called Naples, which has just celebrated its 100th anniversary of being an Italian settlement. I moved to Slave Lake in 1965, April 1st and uh, worked for B.A. Uh, Bulk, which was a friend of mine from uh, Slave Lake. and from I Barhead. Uh, from Barhead. And I just uh, quit my job and had nothing better to do. And one of the directors of the company said I had a friend in Slave Lake that uh, needed a, a holiday, and he hadn't had a holiday for two weeks if you'd go up there and run it. So I went up there and helped him for two weeks and stayed for 40 five years. Uh, we uh, started the store, opened the store on September the 20th. And we weren't really ready, but uh, we uh, opened it in the first five hours. We made close to $1,000, thought it was a pretty good deal. <laughs> uh, that was uh, uh, the start of it uh, in Slave Lake. and. Uh, uh, it's been a good community ever since then. The story is off the boat. What was it called? It was called Barton's Drugs. LTD. Yeah, so it was an interesting uh, part of our life because uh, there was very few roads. Uh, even the communication wasn't that great. And uh, we'd have to talk the... Uh, Salesmen to bring us our liquor rations every now and then by f because there wasn't a liquor store and we even bought uh, liquor for the chief of police. So uh, <laughs> it was an interesting part of our life the first few years and a hard one. We had uh, <clears throat> a couple of young guys that were on the order desk at the wholesale. And we would ask them for a uh, violin bow. They'd run down the street and put a violin bow in our order. Or we had a fellow that was stuck up north and he needed a Christmas present. Would you get a set of... Um, pearls. Pearls. Would You know, anything we asked, those two fellows would run and get. I don't think you get that nowadays. <laughs> Otherwise, it's been uh, an interesting uh, time of our life. I've been chamber president uh, several times. I've been uh, elected MLA to, from 72 one term, and every Albertan should be a, an MLA for one term. Uh, it would be a, quite an experience in life to find out what the demands that are actually really on an MLA when you come from a small riding with 52 different uh, communities that uh, are, are uh, rural, rurally oriented and you have to represent them and then you realize that you're, you're only there to legislate for the people of all of Alberta. So it makes quite a, uh, a change in the, in the way you have to uh, look at your home riding. And by the way, that writing was uh, originally uh, uh, promoted. Uh, the Lesser Slave Lake uh, writing was uh, the first uh, uh, identity came in 1972, and I was the first M MLA at that time. And it was primarily uh, designed for the influence of Native and Aboriginal people in the province because of the high concentration of Midas colonies, Indian reserves, and Natives, which were 
around 80% Native ancestor at that time, so that the government could put in some uh, and understand the, uh, the uh, impact that Natives are, are going through. I can, I, in the olden days, I can remember <clears throat> when we had uh, school opening in the drugstore I had worked in prior was a big, uh, busy day because all the kids from school came into your store, needed their supplies for the year. And Dennis said on the Wednesday before school opening, he's going to Canuso. They're having a Chamber of Commerce luncheon meeting. So away he goes. He didn't come home, and the next day was Thursday. It was the first day of school, so we had we had a skeleton staff, and we managed okay, but he didn't come home Thursday. He didn't come home Friday. So by Friday evening, I'm a little angry, so I phoned his mother, and I said, do you know where your son is? And she said, well, no, don't you know? I said, I haven't heard from him since Wednesday. So she said, did you phone the police? I said, nope. If, the, if he was dead, the police would phone me. He came home Saturday night. But the meeting in Canuso was the first of many meetings to uh, declare the area. High Prairie didn't want to be involved, but they, they went around the other areas that had been uh, declared depressed. And there was federal money available from a place called, was it Herda? Uh, no, it was... Uh Western uh, uh, Western Economic Development Fund. Economic Development. We got seven point five million dollars in back in nineteen sixty five. That was a lot of money. And so, anyway, that's how he started in his polit politicky, <laughs> and never stopped. But Slave Lake has always been so uh, such a good place to live. The people are so, uh, they are so friendly, they are so good that we had such a good time. What were some of your first observations or impressions on Slave Lake in 1965? Well, the first was the mud and Main Street. They had dug it up. We came in, uh, Dennis was here earlier, and Shelley and I came in uh, um, August. They had dug up Main Street from the highway to the airport, the whole thing. So Dennis's mom and dad came up to, get, to give us a hand in, in um, putting up petitions for, so we could live in the back of the store. And I said, okay, we should go for lunch. So we get in the car from behind the, the store, we drive to the intersection, stop, go across the intersection, but we just settled in the mud so deep we couldn't get the doors open. <laughs> Dennis said, didn't you see that semi stuck in there last night? How do you get across? Anyway, that was uh, mud. Dennis would scrub the floor every night, and uh, it, we lived with, you went outside, you had your rubber boots on. But now we have it all paved, and it's beautiful. But when we came, every single night when the sun went down, it poured with rain. Poured with rain. So the people doing the road didn't have a hope. Didn't have a hope. But. The thing is, we, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, we raised two daughters under the education system in uh, Slave Lake. They uh, were fortunate enough to be able to go to university, both of them, uh, with some shortcomings that in those early days in education where you had to uh, send your students out to get uh, a little better French uh, and math and stuff like that. But uh, otherwise, uh, the system was developed uh, and it has been quite good to to the town and its area. Shortly after we arrived here, um, the, uh, we had school from grade one to grade nine, I believe. But if you were going to grade 10 or 11, you had to get on a bus and go to Canuso. Or High Prairie. Or High Prairie. Or Athabasca. 
Oh, and at the point that we came, they were, the school division was discussing making a bigger school in High Prairie and sending our students there and having them in residence from Monday to Friday. So, of course, the province has no money, so you went to the feds. No. Isn't that where Roland Michener came from? The Roland Michener came part of the, uh, the DREE program. Yes. So Dennis was instrumental in getting Roland Michener as our high school. So that was a benefit. The DREE, the DREE program, the Department of Regional Economic Expansion, is probably the program that uh, most people didn't realize how much work it actually did, did in uh, developing the town. They, they paid for the, the bypass road that we're just paving today. This has happened in 69, 1969, 68, 70. And then it was canceled in 72 when uh, conservatives took power. But it, the, they built the airport, made it uh, the, the uh, I think it's uh, 6,000 feet now. Uh, they paid the first road north to Fort Vermilion, was the first cost-sharing road other than the uh, Trans-Canada Highway 5050 was paid by the feds and the provincial, which is Highway 88 today, was a cost-sharing. Uh, uh, the actual was quite an interesting program because it developed a lot of the area and made an awareness to both governments of what type of area we had. So it uh, it was the forefront of what we have today. Oh, and it also built our industrial park, which was uh, six miles east of town. That was all done under the DREE program. So it's a, it was a, an asset which most communities didn't have at the time. At, and when we first came, our, our uh, population would get up to 2,500 in the winter. And then when after spring breakup, a lot of people moved away, so you'd be down to a, a much smaller population for the summer months until the oil picked up again in the winter. But the people would come in in their trailers, and originally it was just a sea of mud where they had to park their trailers. It was, but the town has grown, and we had the Centennial Hall in 1967, and. Uh, We've developed and grown into a place you don't want to live, don't want to leave. Who were some of the old timers that were here when you got here? The, what we would call the pioneers. Um, the uh, when we were we, we were just moving in and getting setting up. Beatrice Lyington was the town secretary. She was the town secretary. She was the business minister, sh administrator. She was dog catcher. She was uh, anything you wanted to label. That was Beatrice. Development officer. Yeah, she, you. But she knew everything. <laughs> Do you have any relations with her through the business? She. Uh, she didn't give us our our business business license for about two years. <laughs> So uh, she was uh, there at that time. There was sort of, and it probably is still today. There's the new and the old, and the old and the new, and the young generation and the old generation. Well, there was the new and the old in those days too, and we were part of the new, and they were part of the old structure that exists. And you know, like anything else, uh, when you're in town for a long time, you don't like to change because change is a frightening. Of uh, effect on uh, on the people that have been here for a long time, and yet it's the only way you can develop a community is by accepting the change. And and we've had we've had our fun with uh, with the administration over the years, and from uh, getting our development license and all that type of stuff, and 
<laughs> dog licenses. And it was interesting. It's been <laughs> an interesting part. But uh, even as today, with the new iPods and all the other stuff that leaves uh, uh, senior citizens like myself way, f way behind, and we will never catch up. And it's, it's their generation. It's a new generation. And it's hard to accept. Well, we, we uh, uh, I was in the chamber president. Uh, we both, Wendy and I, are life members of the Elks, which we were never a member, but we're uh, honorary? honorary life members of the Elks. We were charter members of the Lions. I, uh, were, I was on the Athabasca Health Board for, I think, uh, 12 years. Uh, victim services for 13, 13 years. Uh, uh, attempted to run for council and lost by, I think, four or five votes, but uh, never attempted again, which was a good lesson. Uh, it was, uh, we've enjoyed it. We're like, we've been part of pretty well all the organizations. Ducks Unlimited, we were, were one of the first founding members. In fact, the first meetings were held in one of my buildings. Uh, the curling club, we curled. And we started uh, Slave Lake Wolves as a Junior B Hockey Club. Uh, I was uh, president for several years of the startup. I did 16 years at half the house for them straight at the uh, gate. So it was, uh, it, it was an interesting part. The thing is that the community was developing and you, you were, it was a pleasure to be part of the development of the community and the people around you were always quite sincere, sincere in their, their attempts to make it a better place to live. You and uh, Jack Lawhey were the, was that the Wolves team that you had? No, we had uh, Jack, uh, it was Winter. Dave, Dave Crisco oh, yeah. was the one we started with. The Winter Hawks. Winter Hawks, yeah. Jack was with the baseball. And Jack, yeah, and you and Jack uh, were the. And in those days, there was the Pearsons and there was uh, Amo Pearson Kruzers. and the Pearsons and the Lawheeds. And one of, the, one of the few people that I don't think the town really realizes is that Bob Lacey and his wife were one of the originals. They were actually here before us, weren't they? Yes, and uh, uh, Karen was the uh, community nurse. Community in nurse. In fact, she was the only health uh, person in town. Yeah. We had no doctors at that time, no resident. We had Dr. Rutt for a while, but he left. And once the hospital was uh, on the uh, drawing board, he uh, he he didn't stay till the opening of the hospital. But we got Dr. Joyce and Bat Miles, and since then we've been very very fortunate in our uh, medical um, uh, people that have been drawn to Slave Lake. They've been excellent. Long time. I I served on the uh, uh, High Prairie School Division Board for uh, a, one term, and then got fired. <laughs> Our school board got fired by Minister Dave King, but we did it. We sh we uh, we uh, uh, reached our goals that we had at that time. And uh, Dr. Dennis Bedard was the dentist, and I were the two members from Slave Lake. And I don't think either one of us ran again for the following term. So, but it's very important to have to have representation on the school board there. 
I think my fondest memories was coming to a place where it was the last frontier. South of us was uh, development, north of us was no different than Wilderness. my parents when they tried to homestead on a farm. And the lake was uh, sandy beaches, there was good hunting, good fishing. Uh, it was part of being a, a frontier approach, which you wouldn't have got if we'd have stayed in Barhead or any other community that was developed over the years, your acceptance it was uh, more willingly accepted than you had ever got in a small community just coming up where we, the power structure has been there for 100 years already. So the fact that it was the last frontier north and that the, the, the pioneering spirit was was there for you to achieve and all the goals of life were open to you at that time because workforce the oil companies the health the roads the hunting and the fishing and all that they were all avenues that were uh, that you could achieve and, and do and enjoy were uh, if you'd have been in another community they just weren't there. So that part is my most fondest memory, was the fact that you were able to develop in whatever way you wanted to go in life and enjoy it. I, rem I remember in the, <clears throat> in the early days that when we had no doctor in town. So in the summer, in the afternoon, after the girls had gone for lunch, Dennis would say, okay, let's get the hibachi, a couple of steaks. And we'd go out to, to the lake, have a swim, cook our steak, come back, and work the rest of the afternoon. It was like a holiday. It, it was beautiful weather, sunny, and oh. The salesman would come and we'd say, oh, we're going to the beach, come with us, and we'd all go to the beach for the afternoon. <laughs> and then come back to work. So that was great. Yeah. And we had, uh, we had awesome girls that worked in the store for us. Awesome girls. Helen Lucan, all, all the Lucan girls. Helen Lucan, Hazel Lucan, Aurora worked for Joe's Menswear, and Angie Lucan. They all were uh, our workers. And um, uh, Connie Gullion, she worked for us even before she was married. She's been married and lived in Slave Lake her whole life. And um, Mary Kellum. Those were the first two girls we hired. Right? Yeah. But they, like you say, there was lots of old timers that like the Mr. Pelche, uh, Walter Pendle, even Mr. Kreutzer, who was quite a uh, entrepreneur in patents, and he had many patents on the go, and he was quite an inventor, and, and some of them probably are still on the books. And he had Charlie Scherter. Elmer's dad, you mean? Elmer's. Robert Kreutzer. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and Charlie Scherter. And then we had Charlie Scherter, who lived to be over 100. Called Mr. Slave Lake. And uh, we had uh, the uh, Sinclair family were here at that time, quite uh, evident. Uh, and we had the... Morris family, who were there here for his dad, was one of the pioneers. Uh, Bobby Morris. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, they were here. Kirkpatrick. Uh, he was Kirkpatrick, with yes. With Forestry, yeah. It's an interesting story about Kirkpatrick, is that they own this east subdivision here that we know today. And uh, I was a chamber president at the time, and Neil Gilliatt was on the government. So, and Mr. Kirkpatrick was in the Forestry Service. And uh, he wanted to sell and move back to where he grew up, which is around Pincher Creek, I think, around uh, southern Alberta. So his quarter section become available. So at the time, we had paid, uh, I think it was $119,000 for that quarter section. Well, everybody went crazy that, you know, it was, this is bad. But in the end route, we went, took that quarter section and uh, went to, uh, 
Alberta Housing and developed the subdivision that you see there today. And at that time, uh, the lots were selling for around $1,000 a lot. So it took uh, uh, probably over five years, but then when the province started to boom with the oil prices coming up, the demands for lots in all communities were uh, quite at a, premium. At, at a premium. Ours was still low and ours developed. So it, it took uh, quite a time to prove the subdivision as we have today that, it, that sometimes you got to invest a little bit more for it to mature like a savings bond in the future. And I think that's one of the things that the town needs today is a look at where they want to go and how they're going to invest it and whether they should get in it and invest it and then look what it's going to look like 10 years from now. Well, one, the one, my favorite story, one of my favorite stories is Mr. Pelche was a Montreal Canadiens hockey fan. He was died in the wool hockey fan, and every Saturday night he's glued to his radio, and if the uh, Canadians lost, he'd bring the radio in on Monday morning and tell Dennis, I need new batteries. My radio's not working right. So we <laughs> and all I would do is go to the back and wait five minutes and give him his radio back because his batteries were good. <laughs> and another interesting story is that uh, uh, an outfit, when it, the water line that exists from the lake to Swan Hills for the water flood, we it was a, a contractor from around uh, Ebden. I can't remember his name. But anyway, he used to stop in the mornings and get, uh, they were cutting the, the line for the water, the, the, the clearing of the line for the water line from the lake to the Swan Hills for the the uh, uh, for the to put the water line in. So, and every morning he'd stop about eight o'clock, and he'd uh, with a school bus, and he'd take his, and they'd all buy chips and potato, potato chips, uh, pop, and uh, things, and so on. And then I'd close the store, and they'd go on. So this one morning they come along and they all stop and they run into the store and they, they wanted cameras. So Polaroid. Uh, uh, and instant. Polaroids and yeah, all this. Instant and, cameras. And uh, I says, well, what do you want cameras? We saw a flying saucer. <laughs> this flying saucer was sitting in the middle of the right-of-way. And honest to God, we cleaned out every camera, every piece of photo equipment in that store that morning to catch this. Flying saucer. Uh, flying saucer that they saw on the right of way between the lake and Swan Hill. So it was sort of an interesting morning that, that day. But they never saw it again. Well, no. But there was quite a few <laughs> stories over the years of <laughs> flying saucers and stuff that... Uh, oh, remember the time we saw it on the way home from... Well, home? we don't know what we saw. <laughs> Probably a little bit too much booze. <laughs> We were out at a friend's at Widewater. He he was an uh, employee of the right. weather station. Yeah. Did he see it? Yeah. Yes, he saw it so after we left. Yeah, he, he plotted it. At, when we left on the way home, it was a clear, cold winter night, and we stopped in the middle of the highway. And there, to look no, at the this RCMP thing. were there. And the RCMP were Two there. Two of them. And the <laughs> 50 below, blowing yeah. rain. And we're out on the road Patrolling. watching this thing over the lake. Yeah. And, uh, but the, at the end of the story was that his boss uh, said, uh, the oh, chief, you can't report that. He said, you don't report stuff like that. <laughs> I think yeah, you're but crazy. We, actually, to, to make the story a little short, we went out there with a bank manager. And the bank manager, he had a little bit, uh, we had a little few drinks. And when we come to the police at the end, edge of the lake here, and they were just before you go up the hill there, the first corner uh, going west and the two RCMP were doing a check and they was cold so we offered them a drink and they took it just <laughs> warmed them right up and then we told them that about the thing and they said yeah they had been watching it but it never ever got reported because uh, <laughs> but it was an interesting series so yeah we, we had uh, yeah. Mr. Gilbert 
story of my, you mentioned your store, Barbie store, started in... 1965, in, uh, I th actually think it was the middle of August we started. No, it was September. Anyway, we were open for s the first day of school, and... Uh, no, we weren't. Maybe it was August. Yeah, I'm right. <laughs> no, well, I am. <laughs> yeah, Wendy's right, I guess. I guess so. I'm not sure. And, uh, September. Uh, yeah, and uh, we ran the store. For, our parents were uh, were uh, apprehensive about us coming to a place unknown in the far north, but they were very supportive. Both sets of parents were very supportive. So. Well, we lived the first five years in the back of the store, which made it a lot easier. We could service anybody 24 hours a day. So it was uh, a neat thing. Uh, yeah, and thing. we did. Once the, once the hospital was open and somebody came in from uh, uh, up north, traveled all the way in to see the doctor and needed medication, they'd just phone up and in they came, opened the door. But we, we opened from 6 to 9. Here's another humorous story. It really from 9 sort of till 9. 9 till 9, that's right. <laughs> and at 9 o'clock, we were usually too beat up. And then Mr. Grimiak, who was one of the uh, guys at the t uh, pioneers at the time, who had a small business in town, had a confectionery store down there. And uh, I the went to... The other side of the theater. Uh, yeah, and the other side of the theater. And the building right next to us was just being built and... Uh, had no windows in, and and I went there at nine o'clock, and I went to get a couple of rolls of garlic sausage so for supper. For supper. So anyway, I go and I pick up the garlic sausage at uh, Mr. Grimiak's. I can't remember the what they called it. Uh, well, it was Bill's Confectionery for uh, a while. Bill's Confectionery, yeah. And then Grimiak bought yeah. it, yeah. So anyway, the. Uh, the, uh, I'm coming back, and two uh, natives wanted to decide that they were uh, going to relieve me of some of my money. So I had two big natives, and, <laughs> and uh, so I, I had this garlic sausage in a brown bag. So I backed myself up into the to the corner of the new building there, and they they were going to give me a rough time. So I hit the one with the the garbage with the garlic sausage across the head and he staggered back and I smoked the other one and he gone and they took off on the run. <laughs> but it was an interesting deal that, that that garbage bag made such a noise these guys didn't know what I had in there. The they paper, took off. yeah, the paper bag had yeah. garlic in it. And so, but that, well, that's another time we had a uh, hallway between the two businesses and somebody was trying to rob it. We were having, it was an interesting situation and the first week we were open, I think it was. And right next door to us was the kitchen cafe. Yeah. And she lived in the back of her cafe. And uh, so we're sleeping at night and hear a noise in the hallway. I don't know how the hallway doors got left open. Anyway, this fellow was in the hallway. Dennis had a gun. He got a gun. And... Uh, we, so then we opened the door, and the guy was acting drunk. So Dennis thought, I'll just go see where he's going to go. So he went down the hallway and out into the street. And he said as soon as the guy hit the street, he was motoring. He was running as fast as he could go. He wasn't drunk at yeah. all. There was another old timer here, and I don't know if too many will remember. Uh, it was Tip Roll, or the Roll family. They were at, uh, he had the pool hall here for a while, years ago, and and he'd uh, come become quite good friends, and he'd come there. And he says, well, you know, you're going to get robbed the first week you're open. He says, it no matter. And sure as old heck, this guy was in the hallway the first week we he, were open. That's what he said. He'd come for his cup of tea in the morning, and he'd spin stories. And he, most of the time, he was free fabricating things, but... So you never knew when he was yeah. on the level and he liked to tease. Yeah. But he, then, then he, on the native side, there was uh, Mr. Walter Twin. Uh, his name was Walter Two Senior. No, Paul. Paul, Walter's dad, was chief at the time. And uh, it's interesting because when we opened up, we got a radio station down and uh, we had... Mr. Twin speak in Cree. 
to the radio station and uh, uh, about opening up and all this. And about six years later, uh, a native comes in from, uh, uh, it's not red, it wasn't Red Earth at that time, it's where, where Ominiac is now, uh, Little Buffalo, Little Buffalo. And he loads this, buying all his Christmas stuff, loads it all up the table. And he says to me, oh, I know you. I said, oh, you do? He says, yeah. He says, uh, you have Cree uh, advertising. I said, oh, what the heck, you know. And then it dawned on me. But it took six years that that guy remembered that uh, that, that Cree ad. And he come into my store and uh, bought uh, his Christmas stuff for that. So it was an interesting thing. It just goes to show you how... How people remember. How people remember. Yeah. A another time, uh, when people didn't have any money, they would charge. And uh, we got this letter from somebody in Canuso, and it was a $2 money order. This is what I owe you. We could never find a bill. <laughs> so <laughs> another, another interesting deal, uh, one time, one uh, about 15 years after we were open or so, a native come in, maybe how long, it'd be 15 years or 20 years, anyway. A native come in from the Birch Lake area, and he had a bunch of uh, uh, link pelts. I think there was 12 of them in there. Link pelts at that time were about $1,400 to $1,400 a pelt. And he left them with me. He says, could you take care of them when you'll be back? So this was early spring. And I never thought about them. I put them up in our storage room on top of the toilet paper and the paper towels and stuff, and it got moved around. And I never thought I saw them again. Fall time come, and uh, the guy walks into the store. He says, have you got my fur? And I'm thinking, oh, my God, what fur? So he says, well, I left the fur. Oh, yeah, and then I didn't, hadn't seen it for six months. So I go to the back and sure as oh heck it was up there and in comes the fur buyer. So they, they sit in the back there in the, in the, in the room there with uh, the toilet paper and the paper towels and a few of the other junk we had there and they make a deal. So he sells all his fur to the fur buyer and his fur, this was Belcourt was the fur buyer and I can't think of his first name. So <coughs> And then he gets, comes out and I says, well, why didn't you sell them last spring? <clears throat> he says, well, he said, if I'd have sold them last spring, my f brothers and sisters and sons would have beat me up for my money. He went down and bought himself a brand new Skidoo from Christos and took it up north. So he was smart enough to know that, listen, if I sell now, I got nothing in the fall. If I got it now, so he ended up with a brand new Scandic Skidoo at Crisco. So they would <laughs> that was probably one of the things uh, about our store is that we got left with a lot of stuff. Or They seemed to have a little bit of a trust with us, and they enjoyed uh, uh, the, the way we handled things and did things. And we cashed a lot of checks, too. We would, they would phone up, and they'd come in, and they were going to some conference, and I need five thousand dollars cash checks, and we'd come down after hours and go cash their checks. Or, so it was. Uh, I don't think they ever forget those types of things. And Denny Cardinal from Wallace Gough. Oh, Denny Cardinal was another. Uh, he was pioneer. a gambler. He'd come in and he'd crunkle up a bill, hundred dollar bill, odd or even. That would be the last of the serial number. They did that all the time. He wouldn't stop till he won. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, lots a lot of you know over a lifetime, the, and, and I think we ran the store for what, forty years? Yeah. Yeah, around forty-one years, I guess. W the biggest part of retiring is missing the people. That, oh, uh, absolutely, that, that the people. 
that were great to us. You know, they, they were a pleasure to to service and a pleasure to work with them, and they were fairly honest. You know, uh, we never had too many problems. Yeah. Wendy, can I just ask you to talk about your work in the Um, we just worked from nine till nine, <laughs> and then closed the door and did some more work. <laughs> But we were always, uh, we always had uh, a good relationship with the doctors that were here, and we had good medical people, and then when the hospital opened, we got the nurses. The nurses originally had a uh, residence where they could come and stay because there was no place to live. And, uh, uh, and we had good su uh, suppliers. Good suppliers. They, we had overnight service. Yeah. And we tried to keep Edmonton prices. I always maintain if you took 100 uh, items out of our store, 90 of them would be the same price as in Edmonton. Or less. Which meant that we absorbed the freight all the time. Uh, so we probably didn't do make a great uh, as much as a normal store would have probably made, but it was serving the community was the biggest part of the our objectives anyway. And they uh, uh, had, uh, before they had their uh, their hospital in Wabaskaw, the people there had d just the nursing station and they would be seen and then sent down to Slave Lake in the ambulance. So there was a lot of traffic back and forth and the ambulance driver would come in to pick up the medication and he would have to give you details about the person's date of birth, et cetera, et cetera. It was, uh, and oftentimes it was on a Sunday afternoon. He'd come down and pick up whoever was discharged. So we did a lot of. Uh, and a, a lot of, uh, like uh, we, uh, or Wendy would have to, uh, the doctors would service the outlying communities like Tip Lake, uh, Red Earth, uh, and Trout, R yeah. Trout, Graham, uh, Loon. And the doctors would phone in and they'd fly out there with the, and then they'd phone in the prescriptions. We would meet the plane as it come back, and as the plane went back, he delivered the prescription. So they had daily service uh, pretty well much the same as any other customer in the store. But it was really hard when you'd get 20 prescriptions from, say, Loon Lake, and then have 20 people standing in front mm -hmm. of you that you wanted to get. They were ranting like a Brahma bull there to get their prescription. So it was, it was a, Wendy did a, a, a balancing act that was pretty tough to handle. We had, uh, remember that uh, purity? And she also, the first few years at the hospital. Oh, yeah, I did the hospital first. She who did was, the dispensing in the, the hospital. Who was the first day purity man? Gil Severn. Yeah. He would come up and he would check our, he did band aids, he did. Um, baby bottles, nipples, all the tops that go on the special bottles. He ha had his section, he'd come up, and he was such a uh, responsible and a steady guy. He was there oh, every six or eight weeks. He'd come in, check the stock, and Dennis would say, well, what do we need today? He says, oh, that's okay, I got the order already written up. Dennis says, good enough. Then uh, he changed territories. He got one closer to where his family li lived. So we got this new fellow, young fellow, and he comes up and Dennis figured this guy was like that. This one will be like that. So he said, okay, there's your section. Put in an order. Well, he put in an order. Enough stuff came that we could supply the whole North Country for six months. <laughs> Then he got, a, he got a promotion and moved to Vancouver, so we never saw him again. So an older guy comes to take the territory over, and I was angry, and he knew it. And I said, we're not going to order anything forever. Anyway, Dennis felt sorry for him after about his third trip, and he gave him a small order, and he got, gradually got, he got the respect that he, he had coming. Anyway, this one day he came in and I said, it's Friday, I'm so busy, Dennis isn't here, check your stock and see if we need anything. I don't think we do. So he checked the stock and he's telling me, he's standing at the end of the pharmacy and people are waiting and he's telling me what 
we're low on and what we might need. And then I said to him, well, how are my nipples? And he looked at me and he said, well, they're fine. And then I looked out to see the people out there. And we all laughed. Can oh, the DREE program. For me, it's the DREE program. We would be, uh, we would be a Canuso or a High Prairie where uh, the DREE program. The other thing is, <coughs> uh, Marshawn, who was in charge of the DREE program, was in Slave Lake. Uh, the other one was Cretchen came to Slave Lake, uh, it wasn't, he was Northern, <coughs> Indian Affairs, Northern Indian Development. Affairs, yeah. And we talked to him about uh, the community service program at that time. And so I went in, I think I was the Chamber President at that time again, I can't remember. But anyway, I went into the city to a supper with Cretchen in the uh, Western, West Westwind Hotel, and we were, I never got a chance to really talk to him, but anyway, I met him in the hallway, and uh, in the hallway, and we were going up to the elevator, and between his floor and my floor, he gave the community $5 million and started the, the community service program. At that time, was to be with uh, McMurray and Slave Lake. But then High Prairie come along and decided that they needed a piece of the action. They started squawking, so they were part of the group. But that's where we got to start up on that community service one, was in the elevator in one of the hotels. It was an interesting part of, uh, and that was part of the, 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 the DREE programs. But there was also, uh, what was that program where we got uh, Slave Lake Development? Yeah. Well, that was we. Well, that, that was with the. Uh, that's an interesting one. We started Slave Lake Developments. Uh, I the, guess with the influence of the. Uh, no, uh, there was a we were on a, a guy by the name of G, Jim Ergel was on the Northern Development Council, and Neil Gillett was in charge of the regional development project here, and he brought him out because this Ergel, this Jim Ergel had a, and he was a. A Greek or a Turk, one either Greece or Turkey, and he they developed the concept of Slave Lake developments in a small community, and it was successful. So, at that time, we uh, we decided to put in our own gas system, and we hired a promoter to sell these shares to the people in town. Uh, and we bought our own and developed our own gas system. And at the same time, we asked him if he'd come and sell shares for us with Slave Lake Developments, which were uh, the, the concept that this Jim Ergel had designed. And at that time, Leo Bavere, uh, myself. Leo Jancy. No, I don't think it was Jancy. It was Leo Bavere, myself, Mel Zachary, just the three of us flew in, and we formed the company, and we went with the uh, uh, went to Manning. Uh, uh, he was Preston the, Manning. He was the. What was his dad's name? His, uh, Whatever. Anyway, Ernest Manning was the, was the uh, uh, premier. Re, you know, he just retired, and Strom had taken over. So we went to him and asked him. He wrote a paper on what he called the white paper on social realignment. So we took that white paper with Ergel and Neil, and they developed uh, a company with their law firm called Field and & Sons, which are still in Edmonton, and they developed Slave Lake Developments. But we had to get some money, so we took that, okay, we took that amount of money, we took that concept to Manning, and we met with him, and he gave us uh, 
Ernest, uh, Preston Manny, and he went to Imperial and got the first $60,000. And we built the first townhouses, townhouses yeah. over a million dollar project north of Highway 16. So anyway, we'll leave it at that. And that started our, our housing, yes, slavery development. So. After 45 years, why did you stay in this place? It grows on you. <laughs> Um, it's the best place in, in uh, Canada, the best place to live. It Me? You can't beat it. It's got everything. It's got the beaches, it's got the lakes, it's got the easy transportation, two hours out of Edmonton, and no guns in the corner. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to add? Not too much, no. The Slave Lake Outdoors Group community, thank you for sharing your memories and stories with the developers.